these events to be taking place during COVID, it's even more important. I mean, we are human beings and we are very social animals and we need to find ways to bring each other together and have conversations. So there's two reasons we're doing events like this. One is to try and bring people together again, even though we're doing it in a very COVID safe way and we have all the restrictions on us. I think people are fed up of looking at each other on Zoom um, and it would be much more fun to try as many ways as we possibly can to bring people into the same space as each other to have conversations. So that's one reason, but the main reason that we're doing it is and certainly the reason we're doing it now is that the reports are out, the evidence is in, the impact of COVID-19 on women and girls around the world is going to be horrendous. And therefore we really need to keep this conversation going. One of the big things that kept coming back from everybody was, oh, it's like going back to the 1950s. And I think what people were feeling was that women had suddenly been put back into the house into the domestic space during lockdown. Um, the impact of that for many women was that they were moving back into the roles that were traditionally assigned to women. The care of the children, the cleaning, everything to do with the domestic space. And at the same time, many of them were still trying to do their jobs, just like their partners might be. Often they were doing them from the kitchen, whereas their partners might be doing from, from the study domesticity, <laughs> which was around a century ago. And when you read it and you think, well, that's what men thought women should be and that was their role, and you suddenly thought, oh, goodness me, that is, that is, we are going back. Everything's going back. What are we, what are we going to do about it? Let's have a conversation about it. And the best place to have the conversation, we thought, would be actually in women's houses. We would have had 30 or 40 people in the house. It would have been a very relaxed event. It would have been um, probably round a kitchen table um, with lots of people watching on. Then obviously the restrictions came back in again. COVID safety in relation to numbers came back again. So we decided, well, let's keep, for, for all the reasons I gave before, let's keep on doing it. Let's do the event, but we'll do it. it it'll be a small number of people who can actually be there and let's film it. Um, thank you so much for your patience with us as we navigate all of our COVID requirements. We kind of tried to link it to the houses and of course, obviously this wonderful house of Leslie's that we're doing, the first one, this, this was designed by a woman. So that's the other reason that we chose Leslie's house uh, and with all its wonderful spaces where we could actually commission artists to think about how you use those spaces to talk about the issue. of this sort of event, I'd like to say Bolka Dundal. So that's welcome to the young women. I'm going to introduce you to our wonderful keynote speaker for the night, Walkley award-winning author, broadcaster and social commentator and serious woman of clout and good friend of WOW, Jane Caro, to introduce domestic the Domesticity Weekend. As you can imagine, Jane's also stuck in Sydney, but she happens to be behind the wall. So she'll be with us very shortly. A slightly longer version of what Jane is about to say is gonna be on our website um, next week. It's fabulous. And can I just give you a language warning before we get started? <laughs> she gets angry. Hello, I'm Jane Caro, and I'm so sorry that I can't be in Brisbane this week. Um, for wow, uh, I, you know, it's this bloody boring pandemic. Uh, I have to, you know, stay put in Sydney uh, in my domestic space. But what I'm here to talk to you about is the domestic sphere. What we always saw as the women's sphere. And what is really terrifying about what's going on now is even though we've all been spending a great deal more time in our domestic space, literally, we've been forced to look at it again. And, and that's had good effects and bad effects. And one of the bad effects I think it's had 
is this extraordinary amount of pressure on women because in a way still despite all the efforts of feminism we still see the domestic space as quintessentially a female space and a female responsibility. The first issue, obviously, that we'll be doing on the first night, the Friday night, is the issue of domestic and family violence uh, under the title Lockdown and Locked In. For um, some women, um, that was probably one of the most scary moments that they would have faced, um, knowing that they... Um, possibly had lost their job, he had lost his job, and she was going to be locked in with her abuser. And, and the reality is some women didn't get through that either. The, the, the statistics, I think in May, there were um, double the number of domestic violence deaths in Australia during that period. So the issue, has, you've always got to come back to this issue of why do men hit women? Oh, it's family violence. Well, it's not actually family violence. The family aren't doing it to you. Domestic violence, the house isn't jumping out and hitting you in the face. It is the person in the house, and that person statistically is a man, is a male. So we need to find a way to get this next generation to accept that the jargon is really important. Why does this happen? It is a valid excuse to go, well, if I lash out, what do you expect? I mean, I'm a man and I can't speak and chew gum at the same time sort of excuse. And I just think it's... It's, a, it's an easy place to retreat, but it's a notion that if something isn't going right in my life because I've lost my job or my income's been decreased or whatever, that then gives me an automatic excuse to perpetrate a whole lot of other transgressions that everyone's meant to, um, meant to forgive. It's hard for me to trust in you. In so many ways, um, women have had uh, have borne the impact of COVID, having still trying to work and run a family and run homes and now homeschooling. Um, and I think it's really important. I think we need to run through this eventually, whenever that will be, is to see how those the roles between men and women have changed. I think it will be interesting to see if if there's a greater appreciation for um, what women carry uh, in in home and, and family as well, and um, you know, and that men, and and then maybe it also allows men um, a, a different role in the domestic side too. Leading that up, it, it, it's so important to have these conversations, and um, and I, I just want to thank the panelists for, for actually provoking, you know, provoking thought, and I. I think it's really important that we don't just come to things like this. Don't just walk away and think, wasn't that a really great, great event? Walk away and think, well, what do actually I have to do about that personally? I've always been told that a woman's greatest quality is her ability to nurture, that she is the only person that will water any plant she sees, not the only ones that are at her home. I learned that a woman's greatest currency is her softness and her elegance and her charm and her ability to submit when she needs to. But can you take this fire that I'm about to spit? Anissa, your toes looking really slick. I want to see you tap dance on the <laughs> bench. <laughs> this is the only thing that the world will let me buy back. owner of the uh, house on Saturday is a businesswoman and is involved herself in looking at how we rethink the way we envision what the economy is in the future. I think these conversations are important to happen 
yes, during COVID, but I think COVID's created the opportunity in the space to think about these conversations. I don't think the conversations are necessarily because of COVID or will stop when it, you know, goes away. I think the, the earth and everything and the people who have been talking about next economies and new ways of working, being, thinking and doing um, is an ongoing conversation. But I think this little catalyst moment, there's people that probably were so busy and so distracted and so depleted working in the old models that now this might, these conversations might plant a seed that there are new ways that people can work um, and start thinking about that. And I think, you know, the new, co the new COVID normal, et cetera, some of these are going to become really important about how we work in our communities, in our homes, how we look after our own, you know, mental health, physical health, spiritual, spiritual health and our energy is really important. We are deeply interconnected as human beings and although we have unique struggles and triumphs as war my person, as a, a First Nations person, whatever it might be, we also have universal connection and life force. And so oneness became a really important thing. You know, I did this beautiful um, workshop last week with Julia Kim, who's the Centre of Gross National Happiness for Bhutan, and that's their version of GDP. They're now carbon positive, doing as a country, you know, amazing things. And um, she was talking about the fact that for the third year in a row, majority groups, life expectancy has decreased in the US. And they're calling these deaths the deaths of despair because it's drugs, alcohol, suicide, mental health. And so we're, we're 200 and something years into this colonial capitalist paradigm now. And we're so conscious that it is at breaking point. Even the boss country of it <laughs> is not winning in this story at all. And so we're also aware, and I think that resilience as a black fella comes into it too, because we've had to change so much and transition so much. But we're also aware that we have transitioned economies before and will again. What I do is, I, that's my goal, is to work in the cognitive space and that, but it comes back to the self-healing, doesn't it? Very mm, much to self-healing yeah. is about understanding the brain and what you, when you were talking just then, uh, my mirror neurons were going nuts. Because <laughs> I was just thinking to myself, this is what's going on here, is that you women have come together with a common purpose, but you, you, you're actually being vulnerable. So you're sharing your vulnerabilities, you're sharing your capabilities in a very safe place. And that's what we need to move forward in, in a new economy. It's not about a new economy, it's actually about new humanity um, and how we exist as humans. Economy is just a way of giving you, you know, resources to, to, to stay alive and be a human. Um, and I'm really struck by this purpose piece. I think I absolutely love that piece that you've all been talking about and you all have your purpose that you're you've been brave enough to step out um, and grasp and take because we only live this one life. What an opportunity for experimentation and decentered models of the kind that you are all doing. You don't have to wait for anybody mm -hmm. uh, to do it. So I think the regenerative economy is going to be the one that people, women, people describe because they can see how broken uh, it is and, and that you don't have to wait. by the scars I have and I am a daughter constantly being judged by my body size and I am a brother constantly being judged by the clothes I wear and I am a father constantly being judged by my past mistakes why we're doing homelessness is that that is a house where uh, five women got together and purchased a house together. 
uh, so that they would probably women who thought maybe we were not going to ever be in a position to actually have our own house. Um, and we quite like living with other people, so let's purchase a house together. And the security that that gives women of a certain age uh, and, and a model that potentially could be used for uh, thinking about the fact that older women are now probably the biggest growth of percentage of people who are homeless are older women. It was 2010, none of us had uh, secure employment. One person was on the dole, actually. Uh, and most of us were in the arts, so we weren't in a, position, a great position for banks to trust us and for us to be able to buy a place. And combining ourselves together um, meant that we were able to do that financially. And we also did it because um, we weren't into that traditional model of just coupledom or nuclear families. So um, my partner, Sophia, actually said, I don't want to buy a house just with you. <laughs> <laughs> so when Helen proposed this idea, we were, she said, yes, that sounds great. Like, we, we like that. It sort of breaks down that traditional idea of, um, well, that white traditional idea of, of families being understood in different ways. We've been here ten years, ten years, five queers. We've been here ten years, ten years, that brought me in. When we started working with people, we realised that, um, as I said, we're not going to get more houses quickly enough, we're not going to get more income quickly enough, so we started looking at shared housing. And what does shared housing look like? And is it sharing with one other? Is it sharing with five others? Is, uh, and, and there's all those kinds of issues that we started to explore. We also recognised that a lot of the women that we were working with um, were lonely. And the other fact, and another factor that was coming up is um, most people, when they start to get older, their health starts to deteriorate, and they start needing a little bit of extra care. Now we're not talking about nursing and supporting each other as nursing um, each other, but just some of that informal care. And one of the things that one woman said when she first joined the program, it was like, "I just want to be able to get up in the morning and say to somebody, "Do you want a cup of tea, love?" without having to have made an appointment and put your lipstick on and got bad, you know, just to do it in your dressing gown. Search for your lost super. Does anyone know how much is the ATO has in their lost super account? That's your money that they've got at the moment. Over 20 billion, and that's B, $20 billion at the ATO of people that have just forgotten about their super, forgotten about their accounts. You can jump onto MyGov, you can find it. And these are women that could be 40, 50, 60 years old. I wanna sleep on your veranda And send my tenner for a week The view I love on your veranda puts my heart so happy. This is our moment that we need to grasp hold of that agenda because we don't want everything to go back to exactly the way that it was because actually people say going back to the normal, for many people it wasn't normal. So I want people to go away with, you know, heart, soul, inspired, happy, but at the same time, determined to make a change in the world. And I don't feel like coming for a ride. Can't you see we 